would you stand for me for just a, with me for just a moment? And let's begin by reading the word of God. It says, but we are citizens of heaven. Can I get an amen? amen. Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. On your way to your seat, turn to your neighbor and say, hey, I'm a citizen of heaven. What joy it brings us to celebrate our salvation and the beautiful future we have in heaven as Christ followers. That we don't have to worry about our eternal future, that we can be confident in Christ Jesus' sacrifice for us. And even for those of us who are in active relationship with the Holy Spirit, we get to celebrate that abundant life, that wisdom that he gives us, that strength that he gives us. And as Christ followers, we are citizens of heaven. And we are also very much citizens of this earth, aren't we all? We have dual citizenship, and in that dual citizenship, we have two languages. Here on the earth, I think we can pretty much all agree, we are surrounded by a culture of death. Our native tongue is one of death. There's sarcasm, gossip, belittlement, profanity, name-calling, bullying, flattery, manipulation. If you have ever been around school-age children for any amount of time, you pretty much can figure out that death and the language of death, that's what we're taught and what is caught from a very young age. And yet our heavenly language is one of life. So today, we're in part three of our series, Perverted Stuff, and last week, didn't Sean do an incredible job talking about our sexuality? Yes, I can tell y'all, he had to work very hard on that message. And I am so excited to do part three today on perverted speech. Perverted. This is what it means, having being altered from its original course, meaning, or state to a distortion or corruption from what was first intended. And we've seen along this series that perversion did not start in the 20th century. In recent history, it actually started in the very beginning when God had a plan. And we had a very different plan, a perverted plan. In Proverbs, it says there's a path or a plan before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. We chose our own plan, and our plan is to do what we want to do, and our plan leads to death. In Romans 6, it says, for the wages of sin is death. Things got twisted from God's original design, and that is where our death language, our perverted speech comes from. So going back to the very beginning in Genesis and looking at God's original and perfect design, let's look at the details. See, creation actually began with God using speech. It says, then God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good. God used his speech to create good things, and that's significant. In verse 28, it says, and then God blessed them, again, using his speech for his original and perfect design. And then God saw and said that it was all very good. And then our good God, the giver of all good things, gave the gift of speech with everything else beautiful to his children, Adam and Eve. Now, we know that Adam and Eve were still speaking life because then it says, that the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. But of course, we know the next part of the story. It says that there was choice, entered, free will, and sin. And along with that came every form of death, including perverted speech. And I have never met anyone who doesn't struggle with their words. In Proverbs 18, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Our speech can either be life-giving and life-changing, or we can allow the enemy to bring death through our words into every single one of our relationships. If our spiritual residence is all about life, it seems that our speech should be also reflective of that life. In Proverbs 21, it says, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut, and you will stay out of trouble. Look at the person next to you and say, oh, snap. We're about to learn how to tame our tongue. So I am a woman of many words 
and I always have been. Listen, if I'm going to tell you a story, I want to tell you every single detail of that story. Now, that's sometimes a weakness. Legit, sometimes I can tell, can tell you how many times that words have just seemingly been jumping out of my mouth, thing, feeling like I was out of control with them. But I've also recognized and experienced that once my words are redeemed, set right through the power of the Holy Spirit living in me, all those words can be used as a superpower for God too. So growing up in my home, my father regularly spoke death over me. And my mom, out of fear, mostly just tried to keep the peace between us. See, God gave me a feisty, loud, and outspoken daughter to my father, who really the only thing he wanted was to control me. And I was like, good luck. Now, in retrospect, as an adult, what I've come to realize through counseling is that my dad was doing the best he could with what he had. And I just want to stop on that truth for just a moment. If we all looked at each other with that truth, that we're all just doing the best we can with what we have, what a difference that grace would make. Because here's what I came to find out, that my grandfather was an alcoholic when my dad was little. And I don't know any of the details, but I do know that he was abusive. And my grandfather was a man's man. He owned a lumber shop. And my father was a completely different kind of boy. He was extremely intelligent, pretty nerdy, and not at all physically active. At one point, my father was sent to a military boarding school for a portion of his life to toughen him up, where he was further abused. But then my dad went to the University of South Carolina, go Gamecocks, and my dad met Jesus there in the radical, charismatic movement of the late 1960s. My parents met at the University of South Carolina, and it wasn't long before I came into their lives ready to take on their world. See, my dad was not life-giving in his speech simply because he had not seen anyone speak life over him. And I was there to push every single one of my dad's buttons. Now, I got married at 20 years old, much to my father's frustration. And then after that, for almost 10 years, Sean and I, we lived several different places. We did ministry at several different churches. And in that 10 years, we didn't think too much about having children. As a matter of fact, at one point, I even said these death words out loud. Why would I make a human to hate me? But God, but God introduced friends into our lives who changed our minds, and we did decide to have a child. And I will never forget holding the most perfect little girl I have ever seen in my life and feeling all of my brokenness. And all I knew is I just didn't want to be like my dad. See, I knew my words. They were still harsh and biting because I speak fluent sarcasm, y'all. At that time, we were in ministry at Seacoast Church, and they have an incredible parenting ministry there. Class is called Parenting from the Tree of Life. And that's where I learned from the first time the why and the how to speak life. So today, as we get started learning about all of this, I wanted to say I'm still in progress. But I'm also changed because of the message I started learning 15 years ago. Today's message is influenced by Pastor Gary and Amory Ezzo, who wrote those classes. And they didn't change me as just a mom. They changed me as a wife. I'm a different friend. I'm a different human. I am a changed Christ follower because of learning to speak life. So how do we learn to speak life? In Ephesians 4, Paul says this, watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps each word a gift. Don't grieve God. Don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. Paul starts us out today by saying, watch what comes out of your mouth and don't take the gift of speech for granted because it is a gift, an honor to be able to speak life. So catching up with me when I was about 16 years old, I was definitely very immersed in high school in a language and culture of death. And you've already heard a bit of my story. So at this point, I've got daddy issues, a loud mouth, and a sassy attitude to match. But Sean, on the other hand, had given his life over, surrendered completely to Jesus. 
And he had started a Berkeley High School, an after-school group called Teens for Christ. Now, I'm just going to say, I'm pretty sure that Sean Wood had mixed motives when he invited me to Teens for Christ. I don't know that he was completely just worried about my soul. But here's the problem. I had an after-school job, so I consistently told him that I worked after school, and he consistently invited me to Teens for Christ. I will never forget the day he invited me again. I was walking on my way to the car to go to my after-school job, and he was inviting me to Teens for Christ again, and I flipped around, and with all the hate I could spew out of my mouth, I said, I told you I have to freaking work. Except I didn't use the word freaking, y'all. I used another choice word. Okay, so it's Hobson and Grace. It was 30 years ago. I'm not yet a Christian Connie. And I never went to Teens for Christ, but Sean Wood was indeed persistent. I did eventually pray with Sean to give my life to Jesus. I may have had some mixed motives too. But let me tell you this other story. Sean and I were leading a couple small group at Seacoast Church, and a brand new couple came to the church, brand new believers. We invited them over to our small group. You can imagine us sitting in chairs and sofas. We're in a circle in our den with our Bibles open across our knees. And this guy, a brand new believer, he stops group and he's like, y'all. And we're like, what? And he's like, the Bible is freaking amazing. Except he didn't say freaking either. Now, when I used the F-bomb, it was for emphasis and to destroy. But that guy at small group, he just didn't know better yet. He used the F-bomb for emphasis too, but it was to give life in his context. Now, of course, we gently pulled him aside after group to let him know that his choice word needed replacing. But here's the point. Most of the time, people believe that when they become a Christian, all they need to do is stop cussing. But in actuality, it is much more than that. It's about learning a brand new language, a brand new way to communicate both within yourself and to the world around you. Think about it like this. If an international came here to the United States, you would not expect them to learn English overnight. It's a lifelong practice to learn to change the language of our soul. But listen, when you change your language, you will change your culture to one of life. So let's talk about a few things that are not speaking life. Number one, flattery. A lying tongue hates those it crushes, and a flattering mouth works ruin. I think everyone knows that flattery does more harm than good. But sometimes isn't it just so tempting to be like, I'm going to give a compliment sandwich. See, maybe if I can use my words to manipulate someone to get them to do what I want them to do. But flattery is from the enemy, y'all. And the enemy is a liar. That's his native tongue. So we need to stay away from it because if it's not genuine, we don't say it. We don't manipulate. The second thing that is not speaking life is compliments on people's appearance and worldly accomplishments. Now hear me out on this. I'm not suggesting we never compliment one another on our looks. Here's your marriage tip for the day. On a Friday night when Sean comes out all dressed up, looking like a snack for date night. Yeah, I'm going to tell him. He loves it when I tell him. But here's the thing. Sean's dragon breath, greasy hair, and other less than tasteful things, they're coming back with a vengeance tomorrow morning, y'all. If I'm only into him when he's looking hot, my life's going to be rough. And the same for him, right? Y'all, things are starting to sag this is just, it's, it's going away, slowly but surely. So while compliments on looks and worldly success are okay, it doesn't laugh, last. And it tends to reinforce a bad belief system that our worth and our value is wrapped up in how we look, something that is sure to fade. The third thing that speaking life is not is just being nice. Now, as Christ followers, we do need to be nice to one another and definitely out in the world. Let's smile. Let's be kind. Let's be patient. Just being super nice is very important to those who don't know Jesus yet. It's our initial impression, right? And while we're talking about being nice, real quick, let's talk about driving. Yeah. Anybody's toes ready? So I am teaching my 15-year-old to drive. And can I just say people are the worst on the roads? So Izzy is doing an incredible job learning how to drive, and she does a really good job right here in the church parking lot. 
But at some point, she has to leave the parking lot and drive around other cars to truly learn how to drive. But if she takes two extra seconds to pull out, or if, God forbid, she goes the speed limit on Highway 52, people are bumping their horns, flying past us like we're standing still. So much to Izzy's dismay, I order these magnets to go on the car that says, student driver, please be patient. We throw those things on for a driving lesson. I still got the same result. I still had someone bump at us. And one more thing. Can someone explain to me when Izzy's in the driver's seat and I'm in the passenger seat, does the car expand or do the lane shrink? What happens? <laughs> so let's definitely be nice while driving. But being nice is not the depth of what we're talking about today in speaking life. In life-giving relationships, what we love to do is just focus on the grace. Just focus on being nice. But y'all, there are so many times we've got to speak truth to. And Jesus, who scripture points out had no sin, was an expert at this. Let's look for a moment at two separate encounters that Jesus had with Peter. So Jesus is with his disciples and he says to his disciples, he says, who do people say that I am? And, you know, they give a couple answers, but Peter speaks up. He says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, God bless you, Simon, son of Judah. Judah. <coughs> You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My father in heaven, God himself, let you in on the secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you really are. You are Peter, a rock. And this is the rock which I will put together my church. My church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And that's not all. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom. Keys to open any and every door. Wow, talk about life-giving words. Jesus gave Peter not only a new name, but a new identity with his life-altering words. But right after that encounter, Matthew then records a second encounter between Jesus and Peter. So Jesus starts describing to his disciples his death, his crucifixion, and he's telling them to kind of prepare them. And Peter goes, no, never, Lord. But Jesus turns and says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. See, Jesus needed to correct Peter in another moment. So while it may not seem very nice, it was a necessary corrective truth. And Jesus also said numerous things to the Pharisees, the ones who knew the Bible better than anyone else. In Matthew, he says, you hypocrites. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? What we want to focus on, and I get it, is how Jesus is all about grace and love and kindness. And most certainly he is about grace and love. But Jesus is also very much about calling out truth and conviction in us. So in learning to speak your life, we're not going to flatter. It's not about compliments, about how we look or worldly success, and it's not just about being nice either. As citizens of heaven with dual citizenship here on the earth, let's compare learning to speak life to learning to speak another language. And for me, I'll say it was just like that. Now, if we move to a foreign country, the first thing we do is learn another language, right? And the most effective way to learn another language is through immersion. Immersion meaning put yourself in the environment where the language is spoken all the time. You would go to restaurants and speak the language, movies, music. You'd be at the market. You would immerse yourself into everything in the culture. So we, to learn speaking life, need to immerse ourselves in life-giving culture. This is the reason why being in church consistently, being in small groups, and serving around a community of believers regularly makes a difference. It's why we sing powerful lyrics of hope and truth over our souls. Because when you take a break from church, you get stinking thinking. And when you get stinking thinking, you get stinking talking too. Life-giving community naturally changes the way that you talk because you're filling your heart and your mind with God's truth. And when we intentionally change what's going on in our heart and mind, we will change what comes out of our mouth. Jesus said this. He said, a person full of goodness in his heart produces good things. 
A person with an evil reservoir in his heart pours out evil things. The heart overflows in the words a person speaks. Your words reveal what is in your heart. The second thing we do is we read our Bible. In Psalm 119, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart, O Lord, that I may not sin against you. In Matthew 15, Jesus says, whatever comes out of the mouth has come out of the heart. And specifically, when you're learning to speak the language of life, I recommend regular time in the Gospels, in the New Testament, and in the letters to the church. Now, let me just say, the entire Bible has something to teach us about God. It's his love story. It's his history of God's people and God's character and his faithfulness. But sometimes we need to be very strategic about how we study the Bible and get verses of life in front of us. So a few years back, I took on the task of reading the entire Bible in one year, and I did a chronological Bible reading plan. And so uh, every day, it told you exactly what to read, and because it was chronological, it went through it historically. So that year, though, I was also betrayed by a friend, lied about, talked about, and it was a very difficult season where I did not want to speak life. On one of the hardest days in that season, I woke up, opened my Bible to my Bible reading plan, and this is what I read. I pursued my enemies and crushed them. (laughs) Sounds about right. I did not turn back till they were destroyed. I crushed them completely and they could not rise. They fell beneath my feet. I am here for this today, God. (laughs) You armed me for strength for battle. You humbled my adversaries before me. Yes, humble them, Lord. Of course, the Spirit of God was convicting me and my bad attitude about my enemies. See, what I should have done that day is go searching for life words in the New Testament, like this in Ephesians. The church has taught this. Make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, and profane talk. Be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. I have learned that even in times of the most pain, searching the scriptures for words of life is a skill I have to develop. And I'll say, if you don't know who you are in Christ, if you don't know your identity in Jesus, that is your starting point. That's what you search for. Google it, memorize it, believe it. So one day a week, I take a little bit of extra time, and I call it refilling. And I pour as much of God's truth and life over my soul as I possibly can make time for. I listen to extra worship, read the Bible longer. I stay off of social media, news, television, all screens. I listen to Bible teaching. I pull up spoken word from Hosanna, who was here a few weeks ago. Then I pray and I beg God to show me, where am I all up in my fields, Lord? Show me where I need to get rid of the death that's inside of me. Because I know that the Holy Spirit is living and active inside of me. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead inside of me. But we leak, y'all. We leak. We leak. And the reason we do is because the world beats us up, coming at us with so many lies from the enemy. So we have to immerse ourselves in words of life, in God's love and God's truth. Which brings me to my next step, be intentional. Specifically, be intentional of thinking about what you're thinking about. We speak to ourselves more than anybody else. Last year, there was a new team of researchers who figured out how to figure out how many times the mind had a new thought. And they believe that we have 6,200 individual thoughts every single day. 6,200 And they went on furthermore to say that they believe that 80% of those thoughts are negative. See, what happens when we think the same negative thought over and over and over again is we begin to believe it as truth. So if you're allowing perverted speech and death words into your mind or creating a death self-talk and replaying that perversion over and over again, you will absolutely believe it. Death words are like a cancer and our soul growing and hurting our relationships. So, give you an example. If you wake up one morning and something's disappointing to you in your marriage relationship, if you start thinking, my spouse doesn't even care about me, 
he didn't do that thing, she didn't do that thing I asked her to do. And you start thinking it all day long while they're at work and you're at work. They don't even care about me. By the end of the work day, you will literally believe that your spouse does not care about you and you will resent them. But on the other hand, if you capture those words and change your focus to, I love my spouse, I know that God has put us together, and I know that they probably just forgot that one thing. I believe in us, and I'm going to focus on all they're doing right and not what the enemy has in front of me. Pastor Tony Evans teaches it like this. He says, every time you repeat a negative, defeating statement or speak a hopeless thought, you are literally handing Satan a stick with which to knock you down. These negative words can be about you or someone else. So every time you say, if things get better, or, I mean, if God comes through, or I just don't know if I'm going to make it, you are giving Satan permission to defeat you. You are loading bullets into his already emptied gun. But there's hope in that the opposite is also true when you speak life over your own soul. God says to use his word and the strength found in it to speak life into your situation. We have to stop saying things to ourselves like, you're so stupid, because then you will feel stupid. You will believe that you are stupid and you will live defeated. If you stand in front of the mirror in the morning and say to yourself, you're so disgusting, or you're so ugly, or you're so fat, you have now taught yourself that your value and worth is attached to an unattainable and worldly standard of beauty and success. And so then you'll spend your day subconsciously not allowing yourself to live out your purpose because you don't meet the enemy's standards. Many of us here today are living stuck and not living out God's best for us because of the self-narrative full of death words. The enemy is a liar and he has convinced us that we are not enough. But let's stop for just a minute and do an activity with me. Close your eyes. And I want you to think about and picture the most influential people in your life, people who have spoken life over you and encouraged you. Maybe it's a family member, a grandparent, maybe a family friend, a coach, a teacher, a pastor, a small group leader. As you picture these people in your mind, I wanna ask, do they all fit the worldly standards of success and beauty? Were they all strong, tall? Skinny, perfectly healthy, wealthy, intelligent, winning in sports? You can open your eyes. No, I think you'll find, just like in my life, that the list of people who have influenced me and still influence me today with positive influence over my life, there were people like Miss Pat, a short, round youth leader who took time when I was in that culture of death to minister to me. There were bald men and women with wrinkles Pastor Greg and Debbie. There were all sorts of older people with gray hair and aging bodies. There's Pastor Chip and Colleen Judd and Pastor Gary and Anne-Marie Ezzo. And isn't that picture just the best? I also have people of all ages. I've got very young people, like Briley, who regularly speaks life over me. And then I've got some people who are just a little bit younger than me, like the staff women. There are tons of married people like Tom and Linda Biglin who chose to believe in Sean and myself as teenagers. And there's single people like Miss Jerry who never, ever pass by me without encouraging me. And she's with Jesus today. There are married people with tons of children like Katie and Josh Walters and Julie and Rich Young. There's also people in my life that I can think back that only had high school education. Some were wealthy people, but more often than not, the people that influenced me, they lived in modest or small homes. They drove cars that sometimes didn't start. Sometimes they were nerdy people, didn't have cool clothes. And I wanna ask you, when you closed your eyes and thought of the people who were life-giving to you, did you even think about how they looked? Or did you think about how they made you feel? I can tell you the one thing that every single Christian who has discipled me, who has spoken life over me, who has lovingly corrected me and encouraged me had in common. They chose to speak life over themselves and then to speak it over me. They were intentional with their language. So when I am intentionally spending time refilling my soul, I've come to realize it's not just about me. 
When I'm full of Jesus and his life and his words and his love, I'm ready now to go speak life to the world around me. And this takes a lot more intentionality than we think. We gotta be careful what we're focusing on, that it's not on the things that the world values. We gotta gaze at God and glance at the world. Here's a few practical ways to be intentional in our relationships. If you think life words, say those words of life. Don't withhold words of life out of jealousy. If it's someone else's season of joy or success, learn how to celebrate with them. Force yourself to say words of life. And with our friends, we need to be super intentionally present. For goodness sake, if you finally get some time together with some friends, put down your phones. Look people in the eye. Try to hear where do they need some life? Where do they need some encouragement? When I talk about friendship, I always have someone come to me after and they say, I'm so lonely. I just need some friends. And if you're in that season of loneliness, this is what I found to be true. The secret to having friends is to be a friend. So if you want friends, be intentional. Invite people over to your house. Make space in your day to reach out to people and don't get easily offended. You gotta give grace to people. Say the words to your friends that you wish someone was saying to you. Let's be intentional with our social media. What if as Christ followers, we began to see social media as a place to consistently speak life over our followers and not a place to repost a zinger that you hope your enemy sees? In Ephesians, it says, don't say anything, and I would say anywhere, That would hurt another person. Instead, speak only what is good so that you can give help wherever it is needed. That way, what you say will help those who hear you. Let's help each other on social media by using words of life. In your marriage, be intentional to find the good in your spouse and then say it. Say it a lot, more than you think you need to. Almost make it annoying how much your spouse is like hearing you say good words to them. Choose to make it a game to figure out what words of life you can text them, post about them, and say to them. I will make you a guarantee that if you choose to speak life about your spouse and stop nagging and complaining, you will see an incredible difference in your marriage. Most of the time, it just takes a change of focus. Taking your focus off what your spouse isn't doing and putting your focus onto what they are doing. In our children, y'all raising kids is such an honor and it's such a challenge, right? I've got one amazing kiddo that in this season, I just keep saying, I cannot wait to see who you are gonna lead one day because she has got some serious spunk. I can only imagine the difference it would have made in my life and in my family had my father gotten the help he needed to be able to speak life to me. And I'm sure you noticed, he became a Christian in college. And y'all, today he's with Jesus. And when I go to glory, I think it's gonna be a super special moment that when both of us are perfect and only able to speak life to one another. But in the meantime, I want my kids to hear from me what I see of God in them. Your spicy kid, your disobedient one, your shy kid, your strong-willed kid, the one that pushes everything right to the line, all of them are made in God's image. They are the imago Dei. I love that word. It's Latin for the image of God. So it's worth it to change your focus off of what's hard and difficult in them and where you see God in them. I've had over the past few years the distinct honor of watching a friend of mine really demonstrate learning the intentionality of speaking life at freedom. So y'all watch this. Speaking life over others and myself is not my natural proclivity. So when Pastor Connie said that was something she saw in me, all I could think was only God could do that. As a kid, I was overweight, had wild frizzy hair, an easy target for elementary school. The one thing I did have going for me was my quick wit and sharp tongue. Comedy and deflection quickly became a defense mechanism and soon began to manifest in self-deprecation. If I could say hurtful things about myself or make myself the punchline, it took the power away from the bullies. Over time, as my emotional intelligence and my relationship with Jesus grew, I learned that that was not the most loving way to express myself or maintain friendships. Still, when I felt insecure or anxious in a situation, old habits rose to the surface. 
The shift from cutting down others to cheering them on came much easier than speaking positively about myself. That piece has always been an ongoing challenge, but I've been very fortunate to be surrounded by women who model it well. Jess Connolly teaches, change your language and you'll change the culture. It's something I've been working on for the last few years, but I don't always get it right. The best part about this transformation God has made in this area of my life is the honor of speaking life over all the kids in my life. To give some context, my husband and I decided early in our marriage not to have children. Aside from a brief period of baby fever brought on by society pressure and family expectations sprinkled in with just a bit of FOMO because all my friends were having kids, we decided not to have children as part of our story. With that decision comes a lot of questions and assumptions, the worst one being that we don't like kids or don't like being around them. Nothing could be further from the truth. We love kids and have had the opportunity to love on so many over the years. Jason and I have had the privilege of being extremely involved in the lives of our nieces, Shay and Rochelle. And as they head into their teenage years, now more than ever, they're thinking about body image and how they measure up in the world. I try to take every opportunity to let them know they are God's girls and they are good, regardless of their size, their grades, their popularity, or how many Snap or Insta followers they have. I've also had the opportunity to lead Freedom Youth for three years. Please believe me when I tell you, in most cases, these girls are not hearing life spoken over them, not at school, at home, or by society. The struggle is so real for them, and the encouragement goes a long way. Jason also goes out of his way to teach students that serve at Car Care New Skills, and to let them know they have nothing but potential. The newest batch of babes we get to love on is the brown triplets. Even at 10 months old, I make a point to pray aloud over them as I rock them to sleep or tell them they're good and perfect and God loves them. I don't think it's ever too early to let kids hear that. I fully believe in self-fulfilling prophecies. If a person hears they are a failure enough times, they'll start to believe it. But the opposite is also true. So whether you're hearing it from the outside world or that nagging self-talk inside your own head, words bring life or they bring death. So I encourage everyone to be mindful who's listening, who's in your sphere of influence and choose your words carefully. They're more powerful than you'll ever know. Thank you, Jess, for sharing your story. So we immerse ourselves in life-giving community. We're intentional. And then we learn to pray, uh, pray about everything instead. All right, at this point in the message, I know what you're thinking, because I thought it too. I am naturally cynical. Isn't this just like so some Pollyanna version of life, ignoring the brokenness, messy hurt, and pain? Well, no, it's a biblical way of communicating. But I agree that we all need a time and a place to cry out and vent, to release with our words of frustration and pain. And God is really the only one who can handle all of that. Paul teaches us exactly where and when to go when we must cry out. He says, don't worry about anything. See, worrying is a lack of trust of God and his love for us. So God gave us this command because he knew the perverted words of worry will hurt us. The reason God says, don't worry about anything, is God saying, when you worry, you hurt yourself. He says, instead, pray about everything. Learning the skill of stopping worrying and praying about everything is a very intentional skill. It takes practice. We must think about what we're thinking about and then change it. And then Paul teaches us to tell God your needs. Don't forget to thank him for his answers. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will keep your thoughts and your hearts quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. So we learn to pray instead of worry. And here's the other thing that I found incredibly life-giving. I do the same thing with other people when they tell me their worries. When someone starts telling me how they're overwhelmed, stressed out, and so much pain, my constant go-to is, well, let's pray. Let's take it to God, because he's the only one who can make it better. So we immerse ourselves in life-giving culture. We're intentional. We learn to pray about everything instead. And finally, we learn how to repent. James 3, he says this, we get it wrong nearly every single time we open our mouths. If you could find someone whose speech was perfectly true, you'd have a perfect person. 
in perfect control of life. In verse five, it says, it only takes a spark. Remember to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do just that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it, smoke right from the pit of hell. This is scary. You can tame a tiger, but you can't tame a tongue. It's never been done. The tongue runs wild, a wanton killer. With our tongues, we bless God, our Father, and with the same tongues, we curse the very men and women he made in his image. Curses and blessings out of the same mouth. My friends, this can't go on. See, James teaches us that our perverted speech we are absolutely going to get this whole thing wrong. We're gonna ruin the world, send it up in smoke and go up in smoke with it. But when we, we will mess it up, speak death, the hope is in grace. Because y'all, Jesus' amazing grace, well, it's freaking awesome. The true mark of a Christ follower, it's not in their perfection. The true mark of a Christ follower is in the speed in which they repent. The biggest key for those moments when our words come flying out in a hurtful way is to apologize and take full responsibility for what was said then to move forward with full grace covering and confidence in God's profound forgiveness. So church, let's be a people who forgives one another quickly and thoroughly just like Christ forgives us. Let's be a people that believes the best about one another, even while words full of intentional pain have been spoken. A few years back, I had the honor of being asked to speak at a conference. It was only for seven minutes, don't get excited. But there was seven women who each had seven minutes to, to, to just talk about something that God had done pretty significant in their life. And it was a session where they put us on couches on a stage. We were speaking off of our phones, so we were each had our phones in our hands. And we got up one after another, and they, like, told you when the seven minutes was up. So you had to be done in seven minutes for sure. So I did the first one, and then there was a little break between. And during the break, I suddenly felt very sick. You know, like the burning eyes, the body aches, the headache. It was coming on fast. So we get up there for the second session. It's not my turn yet in the seven women. I'm sitting on the couch. I've got my phone in my lap and I hear it. I feel like a text buzz in. And I was like, I think everyone I know knows I'm up here. But I flipped it over and these five little words from a friend I hadn't spoken to in months, but she was clearly there. These five little words, he is mighty in you. And in those five little words, something completely changed. In that moment, it wasn't about me any longer. It was all about God, his mighty power, his purpose for that moment, that I was just there to partner with him in my weakness. So I finished the seven minutes and went home and was sick with the flu. So a few weeks ago, a pastor's wife of mine from California was telling me about her first big women's event. We had been trading tips and tricks of the trade. I had prayed with her. And right at the moment of her event, I sent her this text. He is mighty in you. And she called me the next day to let me know how it all went. And you know what she said? She said, when I saw those words, tears like flew to my eyes. She said, those are the words that I just kept saying like a mantra all night long is he is mighty in me. See, speaking life is all about pointing one another to our identity in Christ Jesus, to God's strength, his power working in and through us. In Isaiah, it says this, the master God has given me a well-taught tongue. So I know how to encourage tired people. He wakes me up in the morning. He wakes me up. He opens my ears to listen as one ready to take orders. Church, he is mighty in you. So let's work together and learn to speak the language of heaven. Here at Freedom for the past few weeks, we've been having a response time. And I wanna encourage you today, don't leave just yet. God's got something for you in the next few minutes to refill you. Do business with God during this response time. We have four stations. The first one is the prayer team. And I can tell you over the course of my life, people who have prayed over me, y'all, they are so trained in how to use words of life. 
So don't miss the opportunity. Go get prayed over. Get those words of life spoken over your soul today. We also have the candles. If you go over and light a candle, you're just saying, Lord, help me to find light in an area there is darkness. And we have the cross because it is a full act of submission to the Lord to say, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry. Thank you for pain and sacrifice. God has paid the sacrifice completely and pinning it to the cross. And then we have communion to celebrate all that Jesus has done in us. Let's pray. Lord God, we worship you. We thank you that you have paid the price for us, that you are here to take the death away and fill us with life, Lord Jesus. God, we honor you right now with this time. Would you speak to us, encourage us in Jesus' name, amen.